Welcome to another episode of You Should Read This uh, with my uh, co-host here, Tom van der Luba, and me, Rich Dutton. Um, this, on this episode, we're going to speak about this book, Anti-Fragile, Things That Gain From... <laughs> Tom's got the Dutch, Dutch version now. Things That English. Gain From Disorder uh, by none other than Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who was, of course, the author also of... Uh, the Phenomenon, The Black Swan. Uh, this book has uh, been around a long time now. Um, in fact, that's one, some, one thing I noticed when I pulled this off the bookshelf. Um, the 2012, it was copyright, copyrighted, and I think I, I bought my uh, copy of this pretty, pretty much soon after that. So, yeah, Tom, should we, should we dive in? I know you've, you've done some more studious uh, note-taking from the book itself. I wonder if we should sort of lay out the, the main flow of the book before we dive in. Now I would I would I would just say I mean I I uh, I bought it uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I I actually was familiar with with the, with the idea of anti fragile. We'll come to that uh, um, uh, in 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 a few minutes. Uh, so for me it was nil. Uh, the book I like uh, Taleb a lot. Uh, so I would just say it's 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 a very thick book. So it's it's 500 pages. It's uh, very small. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of uh, text on on one page. So so I I I'm totally fine with just picking out. I wouldn't say randomly, but just picking out a few uh, things because it's not possible to dive into all those different aspects because Taleb is all over the place. Um, uh, so. Uh, yeah, I would I would just say let 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 just zoom in on on the topics you um, you like most, and I will probably also speak about Switzerland. Uh, uh, but um, yeah, we'll just see where we end up. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's start with um, yeah the main idea, right? And the main idea is that fragile things break under pressure. We think of glass. We think of china. Uh, they break under perturbation. And the volatility, if they get shaken around too much, they break. Uh, and anti-fragile things actually grow. Uh, they benefit from volatility. They benefit from stress. Uh, they get stronger. And one of the things he, you know, he points out is that he, he had to create this term, anti-fragile, because there is no term in, as far as he could work out, any of the, uh, of the main languages that has this idea. Um, so it's actually, the, the title of the book is actually a new word. Um, the, the closest well, we've got to that idea in literature is, is, is in Greek mythology and, and the idea of Hydra, uh, the multi-headed monster, and you cut off a head and, and more heads grow back. And so he cites that as an example of, of at least the idea in literature, if not, if not the word. Um, so, yeah, that's the, that's the basic definition. Anything else to say on on Yeah, I would, on the, the, word? The, the example, because I, it's, let's say, from a theoretical concept, it's, Perhaps you understand it, but I, I still find it difficult to understand, to be honest. So, so what I like, and there's also a picture in the book, uh, the picture he, uh, he uses is, um, is bones. So, so, and that's something which is probably more practical than uh, Hydra uh, with the heads, uh, because then you can say, yeah, that's, that's, uh, uh, that's something in mythology, etc. cetera. But, but bones, if you put pressure on bones, they become stronger. And and the example he uh, he uses is uh, African women or other women doesn't matter where in the world they they can they can uh, carry a lot of uh, weight on their heads uh, and, and 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 they have much stronger bones than than if we would carry uh, this stuff and I think that's a very good um, that's a very good example which is uh, perhaps a little bit more practical. Yeah, and the other I think I've seen him write in other places. Uh, about the related idea of, of post-traumatic growth. Yeah. Um, and we see that often in people's childhoods, right? I mean, obviously, we, uh, this is a topic close to my heart, but the idea that we can have trauma and that can yeah. cause diminished outcomes in our life, but it can also uh, lead to growth. Uh, and how many kids do we hear of or that, that come from very difficult backgrounds and then go on to become you know, very successful businessmen or artists or whatever it might be? Uh, the idea being there, that actually being... Uh, exposed to a great deal of stress in some cases actually causes growth. Yeah, there are a lot of uh, there are a lot of examples. So there is, for instance, a lot of uh, successful entrepreneurs are dyslectic. 
Uh, right. uh, so let's say from a statistical point of view, there are too many, uh, but it's because they are just solving uh, ways around it. Or uh, next week I do a, um, a book podcast in Dutch about Viktor Frankl, uh, which is let's say all those people who survived concentration camps. Um, uh, you also have them over, often as an example, but but there you also have a lot of people who who um, uh, let's say don't survive it, or or and and by bones. For everybody, is more or less the same. So, so you need if you put pressure on bones, everybody's bones get stronger, but not everybody survives like Viktor Frankl concentration camps and then uh, writes a brilliant book about it. So, so I I I, I still like um, uh, this um, this bones uh, example very much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then and then the other thing, well, when he goes on to talk about systems and anti fragile systems. Uh, and the point that they're made up of fragile en- entities, um, and one of the examples he uses as an anti-fragile system is, is economies. So um, he says that generally man-made systems are fragile. If we think of toasters and kettles and computers, you know, they're, they're fragile. They, we all know it, right? They tend to, tend to break under stress. Uh, but economies, arguably a man-made construction, actually benefit from volatility. And every time in history when we've had governments try to um, overly constrain economies in order to reduce volatility, you know, we, we have a negative outcome. Um, so uh, our economies are comprised of fragile firms, and right? So the, the yeah. firm as an entity is individually can break. But overall, as long as we allow that economy to be exposed to sufficient volatility and stress, you know, we'll, we'll see, we'll see uh, anti-fragile attributes of that system and so and um, we'll see growth under under stress and under volatility in the in the long run yeah what i uh, like about um uh, about the book is that um uh, as you just uh, said is this whole idea of anti-fragility uh, um he, he puts this it doesn't matter in any subject so um in my book on on on, on 23 uh, he has a, he has a kind of excel sheet and and it and it goes all over the place. So it's about science, it's about business, uh, it's about ways of thinking. It's even the way you um, uh, you behave as a tourist. And he talks about the idea of a flaneur who just starts walking somewhere and just just decide, uh, taking decision at that moment where to go next instead of saying this is Monday, this should be Paris, and Tuesday I should be in Rome or something like that. Um, but what I also like is, for instance, if you talk about regulation or if you talk about the podcast we also did in the past, is for him, virtues are anti-fragile and rules are fragile. So mm. it, is, it, is, it is a very broad uh, a book and it doesn't matter what part of life he takes, if it's political systems or foreign policy or thinking or medicine, uh, food, uh, restaurants, doesn't matter what it is. It is, is, he just takes the whole world, so to say. Yeah. Even and the other example I love is that is scientific progress and how we have, there's this myth yeah. in history that when he talks about the industrial revolution, it, it, that we had these, these great scientists who came up with these ther- theories in this yeah. very linear, formal way. They, they moved on to create uh, these inventions of the Industrial Revolution. And of course, he, well, his argument, of course, is no, no, no. This, is, this all happened through the yeah. tinkerings of amateurs um, who happened upon discoveries. Uh, uh, and it was that out of that chaos emerged these great inventions which drove uh, which drove the industrial revolution and, and in fact drive drive all change as he sees it or at least all uh change in that manner you know it, it, all the great innovations come from that yeah. yeah so what 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 topics do you want to take out where you say okay there are just certain ideas and we can't just cover it all what what uh do you like most well i mean one thing that i think it would have a lot of practical application and certainly this is the this is the thing i've taken most out in terms of my life of this book in terms of value i've sort of imbibed in my own life is this idea of the the barbell strategy right uh so this this is the idea that so how do we set ourselves up as individuals to benefit from from anti-fragility 
And so he talks about, well, you want to set your life up such that you have certain assets secured so that you have a certain level of, of resilience uh, in terms of, you know, out volatility out there, but that you're in a position to gain from high volatility. So, uh, so in terms of an investment strategy, let's say you'd want to have a high proportion of all of your investments in very low risk, and then a small proportion of your investments in very high risk, such that you're in a position to gain from high volatility, uh, potentially from those high risk. Um, but you've got uh, enough of a secure income from your secure assets uh, to to keep going. And uh, a poor strategy in that context would be to put all of your money on medium risk, uh, because the other point that he makes in the book is that uh, that the larger the system, um, the the more likely it is to experience a crisis. So if you if you're putting if you've got a an economy, uh, a very large economy, and you're putting a lot of your uh, investments, you know, right down the middle on medium risk, and the whole economy falls over, you've lost everything. Yep. Um, and so he, so that's this, this idea of the barbell strategy. I I liked, and he he applies it even to weight training, which I love. Right, like <laughs> you know, right. do a well, certain he- amount of exercise to keep yourself there, but then when you hit the workout, go for the max, you know, max weights, and really stress the system. Yeah, but he uh, he applies his barbell strategy on uh, nearly any topic. Yeah? Mm. yeah. What other ones do you like, or that come to mind for you? Um, that is what I just said in general. That he, um, what I find interesting is that that he is not strictly focused on, let's say, only business. Yeah. Uh, but uh, let's say if you talk about um, uh, children or education, uh, then he says, okay. Uh, there should, for instance, a certain stress should be there because otherwise they're too weak. Eh? We just had with uh, with the anti fragility, etc. And he talks about the moms, and 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 this goes on and on. So it's uh, it's 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 um, or if you talk about political systems, eh, where he comes, for instance, to Switzerland, or if he talks about foreign policy, where he says perhaps you should better accept small conflicts to avoid the great conflicts or you should have uh, better small fires in the forest to avoid the big fire so if you if you if you avoid small fires for a long time and then you have a huge fire then the whole forest is burnt so and there's a lot of this this uh, aspects he uh, he he connects uh, which which i find makes it interesting to um, to read or to also get an in an, 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 impression how he thinks yeah and i and i reflect on that in terms of our human um, tendency to desire order um and and how that can set us up for these big crises right i mean right now of course a lot of the economies in the world are are hugely leveraged yep. you know, massive amounts of debt and there's an argument here that we should have allowed more controlled burns of economies across the world to reduce the debt levels uh, instead of you know, continuing to, to, to bail ourselves out at various junctures and increase our debt levels. So, but we, we do that because as a species, we want to maintain order, like almost yeah. at any cost, uh, rather than allowing ourselves to experience some discomfort and stress. And this, this stacks up problems for the future. What I perhaps would like to add, because we also uh, discussed uh, uh, this topic also in other podcasts or also in interviews, is that, for instance, he says uh, one aspect is also about anti-fragility, that less is often more. So if you talk about, for instance, risks, where, uh, for instance, uh, one, 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 one uh, party writes about where simple is more sophisticated or the simpler, the better. So it's not that complexity makes systems better or, or, or more anti-fragile, no. And that's, that's also the aspect of virtue or the other way around. What has, has a lot of compliance and a lot of rules make our financial system more, more, more anti-fragile? No, it hasn't. So, and, th- and this is an interesting way. So 
this whole idea of less is more, I, I like a lot. Uh, and then and then his way of, of writing down those things also makes it fun to read it because he is also very strong in his language. So, and also playing with this, and it takes just one example. And then for instance, he takes an example about, and also about philosophy, etc. And then he says, for instance, inefficient is often very efficient. I mean, this is a very simple sentence, but it, there's a, there's an a, enormous amount of substance behind it, and then he takes examples of. And it's also something which you saw, for instance, in the Corona uh, crisis or about value chains, which all go over the world. That that it can be very efficient to have a, a, a certain parts in stock. If you take, for instance, microprocessors at the moment, a lot of companies can't produce cars, etc., because they don't have enough microprocessors uh, or chips on 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 stock. And, and, and he has a lot of examples from the Bible and from ancient times and philosophy and uh, et cetera. And that makes, it, um, that makes it interesting. Or if he talks about this redundancy, he says, just realize that in our body, we always have something extra. So we yeah. have two, two lungs, which I find excellent. So the idea is that we also could survive with one eye or one lung or whatsoever, but most of the stuff we have extra capacity mm. that when we lose something or if we become sick or etc., when I lose one lung, I'm still able to survive. And I find this such a pure, simple and great example because everybody immediately understands this. But if you are in a working environment, it's always about efficiency. But we also have seen this in a Corona crisis. So, so we plan hospitals, to be always fully using this capacity and then something happens and then we don't don't have enough beds on the intensive care yeah so yeah. so you have this aspects of something which is a very actual very actual situation uh and 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 then you read for instance about singapore and they have a whole hospital empty that when they have a new virus they can open it and they have an enormous amount of ic uh, intensive care beds but it's only right. built as a kind of extra capacity. And then you have exactly what he explains in the book. Yeah. The other example of that, I like, is the Fukushima, which he cites in the book, right? That Fukushima was designed to withstand the highest earthquake they'd ever recorded in Japan. <laughs> and this is another point yeah. he makes, right? The future. The future is always new, right? It's yeah. always new. So, so this, again, you want to say deficiency. So, well, we wouldn't want to make it to withstand anything stronger than we've ever had in the past, that wouldn't make yeah. sense, right? But of course, uh, they, they paid the price and so they, that efficiency became inefficient. If you just mentioned Fukushima and the example that, that we only think about the past and not about the future, it's a little bit this black swan uh, topic. Um, do you want to explain the great Turkey problem? Because that's also something <laughs> I really, really like. Well, no, no, go on. You're enthusiastic about it, please. The great, the great Turkey problem is the idea that a Turkey is really happy with its life. And, 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 and he, has, he has a picture in the book and, and, and he says, look at the picture. This Turkey uh, is, get a lot of food and, and uh, a brilliant life until it's one day before Thanksgiving. And that means that what you just said, that just looking into the past to have an idea of what will happen in the future, it just doesn't make sense. And he has much more of these examples, also from a statistical point of view. He has another example I also like. It goes a little bit in the same direction. He says, if you want to have an impression of what's the average wage in Mexico, and you interview a lot of people, then for a long, long time, you have a very low uh, income. Or at a certain point, you meet Carlos Slim, the richest person in Mexico who owns, I don't know how much money. And then suddenly you have a totally different average. So I think this is a very valuable, um, uh, let's say, lesson uh, also for, for, for entrepreneurs, but also for governments, etc. Uh, if you just talk about the corona crisis, we think too much in efficiency. And, 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 and we don't think about 
extra space or or think about the unknown or or extra capacity or or uh, what's in the end effective um uh, and that's something we have uh, really we really have forgotten uh yeah. and then when really ha- when something happens also for instance in companies liquidity uh, if you don't have enough liquidity doesn't matter what happens then you're gone although right. the main goal of your company is to survive any crisis so but if you just say okay how what's the average amount of liquidity people have in the bank as a company, it's just not enough to survive any uh, uh, crisis because our yeah. statistical way of thinking is is wrong. Right, right. And then he talks about anything to avoid the squeeze. He has this, uh, and the squeeze is where we're forced into position where we have to buy something at any cost. Yeah, uh, yeah. And uh, I've been at, in, in periods like that in my life, and I, it's it's not a, it's not a pleasant place to be. And yeah, that that idea to be building up a surplus uh in order to yeah which may seem inefficient uh because we're not using that surplus for some other means uh or in the same way as you say within a factory building up a a surplus of stock or in a country building up surpluses of capacity i mean this is the other thing in terms of the global economy right now is we countries have specialized in different uh fields of manufacture and services and so on um which which does set us up on a global level for periodic crises when when we have a shock to the system because individual nations haven't got the ability to to be self sufficient. Yeah, so it's um, yeah, that's an interesting aspect here. The other thing I like that he talks about is that one of the the problems with with modern society is that we have these anti fragile modern professions um, that benefit at the expense of everyone else. And of course, he uses the example of bankers. And he actually mentioned, I don't know if it was in this book, but in one of the books where he, at a certain point, he had to, he had to hire a bodyguard uh, and, and he bulked up physically because he felt like he was under threat for some of the things he was saying towards the banking system. But yeah, he makes this point that bankers in general, that they're anti-fragile, right? They, they tend to get bailed out uh, we see this, you know, if, yeah. if they make poor decisions and, and the bank looks like it's uh, uh, you know, in peril of bringing down the whole economy. But of course, they gain massively on the, on the upside um, when, when they make good decisions. And so they're, they're anti-fragile, but who, who, who pays for that privilege? It's, well, it's the rest of society. Um, and I see a lot of murmurings right now in a similar direction towards the pharma companies in the current situation with the, with the vaccines that many of these companies don't have liability. So they're making huge profits on the upside of the back of the vaccines, but they don't have legal liability. If uh, yeah, yeah, if uh, these uh, these vaccines cause problems down the line, um, so I, I think that's an important important point that he makes there, and you can see why it's unpopular in certain certain <laughs> segments of society. Yeah, it also has to do, let's say, that he um, that he's really willing to uh, to mention the people, so he really attacks uh, people personally. And also in his language, he is uh, he is pretty uh, outspoken. So uh, this part about the bankers is called on suckers and non suckers. Uh, so he is um, yeah he's a really uh, um, he, he he's not a di- diplomatic guy so to say. So which which <laughs> makes us in a way very funny to read uh, because he is really confronting. Uh, 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 really diving into uh, into into uh, the topic, so to say, but he doesn't in any field. So, for instance, just to take another example about foreign policy. Then he really attacks the head editor of the New York Times because he says, "Okay, he was very in favor of the war in I don't know if it was Iraq or Iran, uh, but but he doesn't have skin in the game." So, is and and then he just attacks this guy and says. It's not, I mean, I don't know, he has not called it incorrect, but in much more stronger uh, words uh, and say, okay, it's, 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 uh, you have to, you really have to attack those people uh, because a lot of people died in the, in the war. And this guy is one of the reasons that people thought we should, we should fight there. And which is also an actual problem if you talk about Afghanistan. eh? So, so the thing he says is, do you really think you can solve something 
or 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 uh, does it make more sense just not to go there and 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 accept a certain internal tension in certain regions uh, and 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 he also takes uh, Pax Romana and he takes the Austrian Hungary and uh, M- empire etc so it's it's not that he just says something he also takes examples from the past to prove for himself that he's right yeah yeah and i think that that's a recurring theme right this this idea that human the, the problem with human interventionism this idea that w- we can bring order to these highly complex systems uh, and how often we do precisely the opposite, right? We actually cause more damage and we would be much better off to allow yeah. these processes to play out, allow the system as a whole to burn off fragile elements uh, and gain in anti-fragility as a whole. And that would be a much, much better uh, strategy in many of these, these situations. Yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, and, and that's, again, I think we can relate that to coronavirus. I mean, it'd be, I think it will be fascinating to see in the long run those countries that have, have taken a much less interventionist approach versus those that are taking a super you know, interventionist approach. You know, what are yeah. the long-term outcomes for the health of their populations if you look at the sort of five to 10-year run? I mean, uh, my bet is on that those that have been less interventionist are going to come out of this better. Yeah, for instance, just to quote him on uh, this foreign policy, he says... Time for American policymakers to understand that the more they intervene in other countries for the sake of stability, the more they bring instability. And it's uh, it's a very good example also, but also the way he writes. So this kind of uh, contradiction in in sentences uh, to say uh, you intervene for stability, the more they bring instability. And that's, yeah. that's uh, I find it fascinating to uh, to read. But yeah. he really attacks. Eh? He says, Saudi Arabia is the country at the present worries and offends me the most. So he's 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 not he's not talking in a very diplomatic way. No, he's really he's really targeting on on countries on pers on on people, etc. It doesn't matter if it's Krugman or uh, so. He takes all the people he. He really hates, and if you follow him on Twitter, it's incredible. It's uh, this guy is—he doesn't really care at all. Yeah, yeah, he's a he's a New York bruiser with, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, this extraordinary, <laughs> this extraordinary <laughs> erudition <laughs> that surpasses, you know, I guess, virtually all academics, and, you know, writing in these fields. It's uh, he's yeah, he's an extraordinary individual. Um, yeah, and. Yeah, and that that makes that makes it so. Whilst it is a long book, and as you say, there's a lot of words on each page. It's, he's a very entertaining writer. Yeah. So um, we dive into uh, countries. Countries. So Switzerland. Yeah, do you want to talk ah, about Switzerland? I, Come I on. didn't. I mean, I really have to say, I didn't. I didn't. Uh, I haven't read the book before, uh, and and he is a big fan of Switzerland. So. Uh, uh, and that's for uh, for his theory of antifragility. Uh, I have to look it up. Where does he say this in, uh, exactly? But he says, okay, Switzerland is the is the best uh, to his um, to his opinion, um, and it has to do with um, yeah. In the end, with checks and balances. So uh, decentralized. Uh, so he he's against uh, centralization eh? from from a conceptual uh, point of view, um, and 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 then he's uh, he's explaining uh, why why he likes uh, uh, this so much, uh, and 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 you have the aspect also of of accepting um, uh, this kind of decentralized outcomes. So if you have a lot of different entities. Then, then, then you also have this kind of try and error, which he also likes. So he's some th- somebody who, who started as a trader, and then afterwards, with his practical knowledge, still had, let's say, the energy and 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 the willingness to um, to do his PhD and become a professor, and then explain that it 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 makes sense to understand how things work in practice. And then he said, for instance, he's a taking Nobel Prize winner. And he says, we at the trading floor already 
10 years before we knew that that was a theory, but no, nobody of those traders wrote it down. Uh, so, so those people also didn't get the Nobel Prize for it, but, but let's say the Nobel Prize winner who, came, who, who got the prize for it uh, uh, is telling something which we knew before. And he's, he's doing this in a lot of, uh, in a, in a lot of uh, fields, but he also does this in, uh, in let's say, the, on, on the organizational uh, field of decentralized decision-making of the different layers um, uh, but even uh, the idea of the of the Greek uh, polis, where where people got certain functions or certain jobs, so to say, uh, just by by chosen randomly, which is a very interesting uh, thing to create a kind of uh, participation. And there are also ex- experiments done uh, with this also uh, uh, at this time, for instance, in Luxembourg, and then they find out just by activating people randomly uh, has excellent outcomes. Right, right. And I suppose you could you could argue that that's because you create you you're kind of creating a, a sense of volatility, right? Because you 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 create a kind of randomness yeah. in the system. Yeah. Um, because you're not uh, presumably when you've got these formal processes, yeah. you're getting a certain level of consistency in the individuals that end up in these positions. But you you create the random effect. Uh, effectively creating volatility, and as that's one of his axioms, is that you know volatility creates uh, anti fragility in in complex systems. The other example that comes to mind, which I've cited before on the podcast, is uh, there's a I can't remember the name of the guy, but there's a Buddhist guy in New York who creates this co- cookie company, yeah. and the, their hiring policy is there's a list. <laughs> you add get added to the list, and when you come to the top of the list and there's a new position, you get hired. And uh, yeah. yeah, that's a very successful c- cookie company. So uh, a similar idea is this idea that formal processes that aim to deliver consistency give us the best outcomes is one that he challenges it. Yeah, the funny thing is that um, I often uh, take as an example because we have this rotation uh, system of primus inter pares. And I always say uh, nobody knows uh, the name of the, of the president of Switzerland, for instance. He says exactly the same. They can usually name the presidents of France and the United uh, States but not their own. And he's talking about the Swiss, which is uh, very funny. And then he says, it's not quite true that the Swiss do not have a government, but they do not have large central government, but they also have a rotation system. So this whole idea of a strong leader and a strong CEO, uh, and Taleb lives in New York, so he is an American, or, or at least adapted to the, to the USA, he's from Lebanon. But, um, uh, and then he says, no, this whole idea of, Putting one strong person as a president is it's, it's 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 the opposite is anti fragile. So yeah. uh, which which let's say in this American context is especially for Americans must be much more strange or counter counter intuitive than it perhaps is for us or for me living in Switzerland because I'm familiar with the idea that if you don't have a strong person that the system is more stable or is he as he would say is more anti-fragile yeah 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 and i suppose there's something about the the again this need for certainty and consistency in in some somewhere in the human soul and uh, you know it takes something to let go of that and 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 trust the trust the system it's also we can also make a link to our first book podcast because he also says small is beautiful in so many ways Small is more anti-fragile than large. So, and the example he mentions in the books more often is restaurants. And he says, restaurants come and go by, but they're always restaurants. You can always eat somewhere. Or, uh, and, and, then, and then he says, this will not disappear. But, but, but the system as a whole reinvents itself all the time and then and a certain uh, uh, let's say time uh restaurants disappear because people i don't know uh are fond of uh, i don't know a new way of cooking or another cuisine but restaurants will always be there yeah 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 that's right and and well, and I have a direct experience of of big not being beautiful because I because of course I was in Arthur Anderson. I worked for Arthur Anderson, the very large accountancy firm. For those old enough to remember it, 
and uh, and who would have thought that would eventually go under pretty much overnight? Yeah, a massive global uh, accounting firm just went pop based on uh, yeah one bad audit in 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 America. I wasn't working there at the time. Um, yeah. And, and yet again, I suppose that's another part of the human condition. There's this part of us in all of us that want to grow things big, right? We, we want to be yep. involved in big things. We want to, we want to scale things. And, uh, and, and I suppose that that's an ego, ego driven, but the, all of yep. these, 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 the, you know, it's whether we, whether it's the desire for certainty and control and consistency, it's from the ego, whether it's a doubt to, to scale, uh, whether it's, the the desire to be the big man or the big woman in a, in a, such a you know political system these are all uh dry human drives uh that uh, i guess he's pointing at here and challenging i, will, I also wanted to uh, mention something which we also uh, discussed in the past is um uh, he talks in a positive way about the european union which i like a lot um and he says in my book it's on on page uh, 90 it's uh, away from extremistan and he says thankfully the european union is legally protected from over centralization thanks to the principle of subsidiarity and that's also something i mean i i was educated to uh, to work uh, in the in, in the government or uh, i wanted to become a diplomat and this whole idea of subsidiarity which i know from the state system where we also did a podcast about that's something which i took uh, uh, into the companies, because I said, okay, this idea of subsidiarity, you have to decide, let's say in the city or in, in a neighborhood uh, uh, and not in discussing this in the parliament. So, so giving the power to, to where it makes sense to take the decision, that's something which I know from the state system. But then it comes, which I like a lot. Uh, he says, this idea was inherited from the Catholic church. Also interesting. So, so this book has an enormous amount of dimensions and also a lot of things which you perhaps wouldn't immediately expect. So you wouldn't expect, let's say, an American author writing something very positive about the European Union or connecting this with uh, subsidiarity in the Catholic Church, etc. So, so it is a really broad uh, way or also intellectual way of connecting all those uh, different dots. Yeah, but you can also see how the extent to which a drive towards consistency and order and centralization within the EU is creating its own fragility. I mean, look at the case of Britain, right? Mm -hmm. You know, arguably there wasn't enough of a commitment to subsidiarity in the case of Britain, and it was their drive for order and consistency, which, uh, which sort of forced the hand of the Brits. Yeah, the, the question is, does, uh, does it say more about the, the European Union or does it more say about national politics in Britain? But that's perhaps a topic for another time because, I mean, uh, but it's still, it's still I mean, I, can, I, I just took the EU, but, but at the moment, uh, a Dutch journalist wrote a book about um, comparing the Ottoman, uh, the Austria-Hungary uh, time uh, and compare this with the European Union and say, okay, it won't be better. So just forget about this whole idea that it will be better. This is the best you can get. And that's exactly the same idea of this anti anti fragility, hmm. which 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 I like uh, uh, I, I I like a lot. And he says, for instance, the Ottomans, like the Romans before them, let local elites run the place so long as sufficient tax was paid. Pax Ottomana, and that's like the Pax Romana, but. There's another aspect which I also uh, talk a lot about. It's about uh, Genoa and Venice. So I had to do a talk in, in, in Italy, a management talk. And then I thought, okay, primus in the Paris, how shall I explain this? That it makes sense to rotate and not putting this C CEO on top, who is much more clever than all the other guys and mostly guys. Uh, and I said, okay, uh, let's take Venice. And then you see that, for instance, Venice from 700 until 1700, 1700, 1000 years were a very rich city. So this whole Republican idea of, 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 of citizens in a city governing the city, but also rotating is something very powerful. And he takes this. So, but he also takes Germany and Italy, 
with a with a very decentralized structure. Uh, th th those those countries became national countries very late, 1870, much later than other countries, and and that has has also been their strength because it's not one capital, it's not one part of the of the of the country which is strong. It's a lot of different regions with its own culture and its own uh, certain uh, focus on certain industries, etc. But he also takes takes this uh, from the uh, from the from the past, and I think uh, Genoa and Venice are very good examples. So, and what Genoa is another example of where they had a, a republic with a, a rotational yeah. leader, right? Yeah, and you can still see on the paintings where, for instance, those elections are on in in Venice, etc. But you also have, as in the Renaissance, that. Uh, doesn't matter what it is. If you go to Tuscany, etc., it's it's all the same. You have those merchants, and they. I mean, it's still elites, but it's not. It's not the king. It's not uh, Louis XIV, uh, uh, and 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 they had the, this typical French system and the huge, the huge palaces, etc. But it's the same in Amsterdam. So you have a, a very broad uh, wealth, and you have a lot of merchants. And you have those houses on the canals, but you don't have, I mean, Netherlands is monarchy at the moment or since a longer time. But in the end, it's a Republican structure which, which stabilizes uh, the power in, uh, in the society. And that's, uh, that's an example he also uh, uses. Yeah, yeah. Good. Um, well, we've uh, you know, we've, we've been going for almost an hour now. Is there, is there any, any final... You know, final final thoughts that you don't think we've covered? No, I really uh, I really like the book, but it's really uh, heavy, heavy stuff. So I would recommend people, if, if you like the topic, it's much easier to uh, Google on YouTube uh, because it's also a delight to listen to him. And it's, 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 it's much easier than, uh, than reading uh, 500 pages. So I would say first, if you like it, Google and, and have a look. He, he did talks on Google, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, the Google talks are and, very good. Yeah, the Google have, talk is yeah. an excellent uh, example. And, and, and then after, if you, if you, if you want to, uh, to dive into it much deeper, then, um, then uh, I would, I would uh, take the book then after that. But if you, if you start with the book, this is probably one of the most difficult books I read for, uh, for this kind of podcast. Right. Yeah. And the other thing I'd say is it, I, I actually think it, it, it's the best of his books or certainly in terms of it's provided the most value of my life. You know, that's the other thing I'd say. So if you're going to start anywhere with Taleb, then uh, definitely this one, Andrew Fredra, would be my recommendation. But do you have, uh, do you have, for instance, because you immediately react on the Google talk, do you have another um, uh, example, for instance, because I think that his, there's his talks which are on, 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 uh, on YouTube are excellent. And the funny thing is what I like a lot is that he really interacts with his audience. So it's not that he always talks exactly the same. No, he goes to Google and then he, then he starts asking them questions. Yeah, yeah. And that makes it even more interesting to, uh, to listen to. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I don't, I don't have another specific talk, talk in mind. I just, that's the one that, that stands out. Um, it's been a while since I've watched any of his talks, but that's just the one that sticks out as being a good one. Yeah. All righty. Well, Great. thanks again. Another book. Uh, Nailed. <laughs> anti, yes. anti fragile. Uh, this has been a, a delight. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tom. Yeah. Thank you, Richard. I hope you enjoyed this episode of You Should Read This with me, Richard Atherton, and my fantastic co host, Tom Van der Luba. If any of the material in this show resonated with you, if you're thinking, perhaps, how could I take these ideas and apply them in my own leadership or or take them forward into my own organization, then I would love to have a conversation with you about that. If that feels like that could be a valuable use of your time, then please do click on the Calendly link in the description for this episode. and That will allow you to book a slot directly into my calendar. And I hope to speak to you soon.